Hey guys, this is GM Josh Fidel, and I am back with the autopsy series. So I want to apologize for being away for so long for those of you who are waiting for some episodes. I was traveling a bunch during the summer, busy with other things, generally lazy of course. But my plan is to restart this series and keep it going pretty consistently throughout the fall, so there'll be one the plan is to make one a week, so to give you guys plenty of material. And I thought I would start out with actually a game of mine. So I've been showing some classic games, I've shown some modern games, I've shown featured certain players, but it's important to know how to do an autopsy on your own games because as we know, going over your lost games can really be quite important when you're dealing with as far as just improving and as far as figuring out what you really have to work on. So to give you some background on this game, this was a round robin I played in the spring. Uh, I was white against a very, very solid Armenian GM, Robert Agasarian. From, and he lives in the States now, but he's from Armenia. Very solid player. I, it obviously, in a round robin, there's lots of preparation, and I saw that his openings were very consistent, but they were also very well prepared, and he had a good feel for the positions. And when you're playing a round robin, there's a different feel because there is so much prep. And because oftentimes the tournament situation will really dictate how you play, which is not necessarily a good thing. But in this case, this was a strange tournament for me to go over because I actually ended up with uh, gastroenteritis a few days into the tournament. So it's one of those where, you know, for a lot of the tournament, I was just trying to hang in there. And this was definitely a game where I didn't feel my best. But at the same time, there's kind of a tendency to dismiss such games. Like, okay, I lost because I, was I wasn't feeling my best, etc., etc. But the fact is that I'm a professional chess player. It's what I do for a living. So these are things you have to overcome sometimes. And if you decide not to play because you're sick, that's a very normal decision and a good one. But if you're in a round robin, dropping out is a real pain for everyone. So, you know, as long as you're going to play a game, you have to make sure you bring your best chess, which I certainly tried to. Uh, I didn't succeed this game, but uh, in general, I was definitely giving my best effort. But sometimes the tendency is to dismiss such games because you weren't at your peak. And I think this is a mistake because sometimes when you're not at your best, some of your mistakes actually get highlighted. So while I might not make more mistakes if I'm not feeling well, I'm actually going to it's actually going to highlight my weaknesses and what I need to work on. So I think it's very important to go over games in such situations. And it also brings to mind, at least for me, uh, one of my favorite movies is The Hustler from 1962, I believe, for, with uh, Paul Newman. And one of the great lines from this movie was basically, you know, he was talking to the main character who basically would got drunk and lost uh, a pool match, to sum it up. And the whole deal was, he said, you just the drinking was just an excuse for you to lose. So regardless of whether you're not feeling your best or have a headache or something's wrong, your girlfriend left you, your boyfriend left you, something happened, there's always an, it can form as an excuse for you to not do your best and to, to lose. Now, if you're sick or not feeling well, are you going to play as well? Probably not. But you want to make sure you're still you know, doing your best to put forth the effort because the, the tendency for a lot of people which that line highlights is that when something, they're not doing something, they're not feeling their best or something's a little off, they'll use that as an excuse to kind of not do their best. And if they lose, ah, it's okay. And I think that it's an important factor to consider when you're playing a game in such a situation. But okay, enough jabbering from me. I'm sure you guys will think that more than once. So the game started, I was white, so I decided to take him on in one of his main systems. A lot of the times against people who play lots of things, I try to dodge a little bit, I'll play King's Indian Attack, I'll do other things. But I've been really trying to play more mainline D4. So he plays Queen's Gambit Declined every time. And this is actually a line I play for black, so I don't have a ton of experience on the white side, but on the black side I've played this a number of times. So exchange, bishop f4. The idea of bishop e7, of course, is to avoid a potential pin on the diagonal. But again, I don't want to focus on the opening. I want to focus on mistakes a bit more. But I did have a novelty prepared in this line. So here, the idea is black wants to develop the bishop before playing knight d7. 
And obviously if the bishop on f5 can be exchanged for the one on f1, it's usually nice for white. So usually white tries to do something aggressive. And that's what I did. I played g4, which is actually the main move. So going back to g6 often runs into a pawn storm. So the bishop tends to slide back to e6. I play h3. It's more ambitious to play h4 and try to go for an attack. Or at the very least push your pawns more aggressively. But I kind of like the slightly more conservative approach. Knight d7. And here is my idea with queen b3. So I believe this was played a couple times, but it was never really a serious move. Uh, but I actually think it has some venom without getting into too many details. Not because I don't want to give away all my prep. Uh, I, you know, I'm willing to discuss moves, but it's more that I don't want to focus too much on the opening. But the main idea is that black doesn't have a convenient way to defend this pawn. A move like b6, of course, is horribly weakening. The c6 pawn's now weak. You can't really castle queenside. This is not an ideal solution. So the two main moves would be queen b6 or knight b6. And one of the ideas is that if you play queen b6, which looks natural, I draw back to c2. And the idea is that the queen on c b6 is unfortunately placed. Because you'd love to play h5 here, but now I have g5. And because the queen and bishop aren't lined up, the g5 pawn is supported properly. So again, sometimes it's subtle stuff that leads changes equality into slight advantage. But okay, he played knight b6, which is very logical. And now I play knight f3. And the whole purpose of this queen b3, knight b6 maneuver, because knight b6 looks useful, but the problem black has now, black would love to play g5, followed by h5, but now I have the move bishop e5, because the knight can no longer take it. And having to play f6 here would be very unfortunate for black. So he very understandably played bishop d6. And I didn't have this move in my notes for some reason, but I don't know why. It's a very logical move. In general, black likes to exchange these bishops off just to give a little bit more space for his pieces. And it also gives the e7 square for the knight, which might prove useful. So here I played bishop d3. So what was a shame about this game for me was that I thought I played the beginning phase of the game quite well. And I was... I only spoiled it later, which is never a good feeling when you've built up a position and lose. But without getting too far ahead of ourselves, he decided to take and play h5, which is understandable, but in my mind, very risky because he's running the risk of my pawns just shoving down the board. This d pawn is not really a weakness just yet, but he's trying to play aggressively because if he just plays his knight out in castles, his king could come under heavy fire with my pawns rolling up the board. So it's understandable he's trying to create counterplay. Objectively, I think it is quite risky, though. So I thought for a while, but I came up with a good idea. I castled queenside. So the point is that after takes, 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 he can't really capture this pawn because I play rook h8, and this pin followed by knight e5 coming in is just way too strong. This is not a very safe way for him to play. And in fact, I, I think it's just terrible. So he plays a much more sensible move with queen, B, queen d6. And the idea is that this f4 square is a little bit tender for me. And it makes it a little bit annoying to, to deal with. So here I decide to play knight e5, which makes a lot of sense. He plays f6. And I play knight g6. So once again, taking this g4 pawn is possible, but quite risky. Uh, after a move like rook e1 check, the king doesn't really have a great... The king has to move, which already is not a good thing. But also, it doesn't really have a great square, and he can come under heavy fire. For example, after knight takes, check. Going to f7 looks suicidal, because knight h8 is even available, and probably would not be taking a draw there. Uh, but he also has a move like king d7. But now I have, for example, knight a4... And knight c5 comes into play, and this just looks extremely annoying. And if the king goes to d8, I can even play knight e4, because the knight on g8 hangs. So this is a very dangerous position, and my opponent very understandably decided to castle instead. One thing I noticed about Robert is that his play, he doesn't mind playing sharply, but he has an emphasis on solid play. So if he has a solid option, he will go for it, but he definitely doesn't mind if you open the game. And this is a very typical style of someone who's well-trained. They're very solid, but if you want to come at them, they're more than happy. So f5 I played, bishop f7, and this was a key moment of the game. So I played a move which he missed and felt after the game like it was extremely strong. 
during the game, I was very confident about this move, and I thought that it was the right approach. As it turns out, it's probably not best. Uh, I played a very surprising move for him, queen a3. And we'll get to this move later. I don't think it's a poor move, but it probably wasn't my best. And this is one of the key moments where I'd like to start. So one of the lines I really moves I really wanted to play was this move rook h7. And I like this move, but the problem I felt was that I was my king was a little bit loose. So after bishop takes knight, if black doesn't take this knight, it's hard to actually penetrate. Pawn takes, queen f4 check, king b1. And here, king set f2 is possible as well, but the move that worried me was queen takes d4. And my and I, here I stopped thinking that, okay, this is too dangerous, I don't have to do this. But the fact is that this is sloppy calculation. This is a sloppy way to go about things. When you're calculating a sharp line, you have to calculate it to the end. And to stop here before forcing moves are cleared up and before I have a clear idea of the position is, in my opinion, a really bad mistake. And if I had looked a little further and I saw bishop f5 check, followed by rook takes g7, I'd realize that, whoa, my position's pretty good. I'm down some material. For example, black can play queen takes f2. But now, for example, a move like a3, just giving my king a pocket to go to. My king's perfectly safe. Notice how the knight cannot go to c4 because of b7. And the problem for black is that almost no piece has moves. Uh, my g-pawn is outrageously strong. The knight's trapped. The rook's not doing anything. This knight can't move. Even though I'm down a pawn here, black's position is horrible. All I have to do is move my rook and play g7, and that guy's almost queening. So even though my position, it's, it's not entirely clear, and it's not like, oh, it's just game over right away, this would be a very, very strong position for white, and I should have given this more time. An understandable, at least for a human, in my view, a very understandable decision, but I could have done a little bit better in calculating to the end. So that was one of my first mistakes, but not, a, not the real game changer. I played queen a3, which is a very interesting move. It looks very counterintuitive because it looks like I have some initiative going. Why am I trading queens? But in my opinion, in the end game, the fact that my king's open doesn't mean as much. And with rook coming into h7, I thought that that would be just completely deadly. But it was also based on a calculation. So black took on a3. I recaptured, and black played the only sensible move, which is knight h6. Otherwise, rook h7 is going to come in, and once I win those pawns, it's just death. Now, in this position, I took a good long think, and this is where I really started to go astray. So my mistake has a tactical flaw, and I find that one of the biggest problems when people try to go over their own games, is that when they see a move and they miss a tactic, they're like, okay, I blundered. Almost all blunders stem from something else. You might have blundered because you overestimated your position. You might have not had the right idea about how to play. You might have misevaluated how good or bad a certain piece was, or maybe your king is weaker than you thought. There are so many ways to misevaluate a position, but I would say that most bad blunders occur because people did not evaluate or assess the situation properly in the first place. And when you do that, blunders are much more prevalent. Now, if you calculate absolutely perfectly, it shouldn't matter what your view of the position is. And it's one of the reasons why the stronger the calculator, the more they can get away with not evaluating the position properly. But I would also say that this is something to really avoid because it means that your calculation has to be perfect. And no one's is. So evaluation before calculating properly is very important. I thought my position was super promising here. And I played a move which really is based on a tactical feature of the position, which just doesn't work. My tactical idea fails. So that was part of it. But I also pl played this move, in my opinion, a little fast. It wasn't even that fast, actually. I take that back. I spent about 10 minutes here. It was more that I had to make sure this move worked a little bit better. So I played the move g5, which is, a, which is a mistake in my opinion, and actually practically a bigger mistake almost than objectively. Uh, objectively, maybe I'm okay after this, but my position is very tough to play. So one move which I spent way too long on, and this should have been a red flag to me, was f4. 
And the reason I wanted this move is because I felt like if my rook penetrated to h7, it was GG. Like the game was just gonna not last very long. But this was a clear mistake. After knight takes g4, rook h7, one thing that took me forever to see, and I'm a little bit ashamed to admit it, is that let's say this happens, knight c4, black's knights are hopping in, so I need something killer. After rook takes g7, black can simply play here. I'm not doing anything. If knight f8, then rook e7, threatening rook e1. I'm doing absolutely nothing. But one feature which I failed to notice until after thinking a while, which I should have paid attention to, I don't have a g-pawn. So these f-pawns are not going anywhere, and f6 is hard to win. So to calculate this line where I lose my g-pawn, where bl black has me completely blockaded, is just silly. This is not something I should have spent so much time on. And obviously I didn't play the move, so you can't call it a blunder, but when you're wasting time on moves like this, it often means you're too ambitious. And I was definitely too ambitious. I was thinking too, all right, I have to go for the throat right away. I have to try to break down Black's defenses. And this is just not so. In this position, I have the very simple f3. And this move I saw, but I thought, okay, it's not so clear. I play slowly. But the fact is that it's hard for Black to formulate a plan. This knight on h6 is completely out of play now. And black can play moves like knight c4 and rook a e8, but they're not really going anywhere. I can improve my king. Sometimes if knight c4, I can capture it and play knight e4, which can be powerful. And basically, it's I'm not do even that much better here, but I, in my view, it's a more pleasant position for white. It's hard for black to take advantage of my weaknesses. And I do have to be careful, because in the long term, the double day pawns and the d pawn could be very bad for me. But for the moment... Black's bishop's not that great, the knight's out of play. Taking on g6 in general is dangerous, because if I land a knight on h5, then it's bad, bad news. But in general, I'd say this position is not super clear, and that I definitely should have good chances uh, to maybe get an advantage. Not that it's easy, but I should have paid more attention to this simple but very nice idea. And the fact is, you can play a move like f3 without burning all your time. Whereas the lines I was playing were very concrete. Now... To be fair to myself, if this works tactically, this move is excellent, but it just doesn't. And the main thing I missed, so here I played knight e5, because luckily I calculated again and realized my mistake. But after f6, which was my plan, I thought he was dead. I thought, okay, I'm going to take on g7. It looks just terrible. But the fact is that it's very important to make sure, especially you're playing a really strong player. They might have blundered tactically, but probably not. So you want to make sure you give it that extra look, because here it looks very promising, but black has a very simple solution, which is bishop takes g6, and then the very nice move, rook d6. So if f7, the rook goes to f6, I got nothing. If takes on g7, just takes here. I can take this knight, but after takes, I'm just down a pawn with a horrible structure. This is just dead lost. So I realized my mistake, but... Already the problem is I've given up my g-pawn, the knight on h6 is a little less bad, and really I don't have that much to play for. Just because my pawn structure is so bad, even if I achieve something, it's going to be hard to ever do anything. But luckily for me, I do get the e5 score for my knight, which is kind of nice. Black plays rook f8. Of course black's very happy if I take this bishop. I play rook g1. And I don't know if objectively his move is the best, but it's very understandable for me. He plays g4. And this is a move, again, I feel like is very practical, because if I want to take the pawn, which I should, otherwise black's just very solid, I have to trade off my best piece. And that's a very nice trick to do, because if he had let me take on g5, maybe he could have arranged something to go after the f pawn, but that's more concrete, that's more tactical. And to be quite honest, it's not necessary. By forcing me to give up my best piece, he makes life harder for me. So I already was not super happy with my position, but I still felt like it was salvageable, like I hadn't done anything wrong enough to be lost. So I took this pawn, takes rook takes, and black plays very simply with rook g8. And this was a really critical moment for me. And I chose very poorly here. So, at first glance, the position doesn't look so bad, right? I have the rook on g8 is super passive. I have two sets of double pawns, but they're nothing close to weak at the moment. 
The one thing I didn't like about my position was my net on C3. So my main idea was, okay, Josh, you have to fix this tonight. So the main moves I was looking at were between knight d1 and knight e2. I thought for a, a while, but I decided, look, Josh, you have to just play a move. Both of these moves are possible. I saw the time ticking down. I was not in severe time pressure, but I don't want to get there. And I played this move a little bit quickly with knight e2. Now, I would say that when I looked at this position after the the fact i look at it after the game and usually i browse with it with a computer when i go over my games at home i don't do that but when i went over it uh, right after i wanted to see where i blundered i saw the computer said oh i play a4 i play rook g1 i brew my king up and it's about even and i stopped there and i thought that okay you know i probably should have held this position but i failed here and i played a mistake but in my opinion this is a very bad way to go over a game. So apart from just the mistakes I made during the game, I'm actually trying to show the mistakes I made while analyzing it. I went over this game with a GM friend of mine who I studied with sometimes, Jesse Cry. You guys are probably familiar with him. And he thought this was, the way he phrased it, he said, you're doing yourself a disservice by looking at it with the computer. And the main reason is because for a computer, this might be very holdable. For a human being, this position is awful. Now, is it dead lost or even lost? Almost certainly not. I don't, my weaknesses are bad, but black's a little bit too passive. And if I organize my pieces in a, in a correct fashion, it's very difficult. So the line the computer likes, it wants to play a4. So in my opinion, I would have played this if I thought he'd allow my pawn to a5, because that at least looks annoying. Then b7 could be weak. So the move I expected would be a5, and I wasn't sure these moves favored me. But the computer wants to just fix the rook, go back to g1. It doesn't do anything on g4. King d8, bring my king up. And the whole point is that now I have rook b1, always. But the fact is that even for a, while for a computer this might be very holdable, for a human being it's not so easy. Black can maneuver the knight to d6, for example. I can try to maneuver it to g4. And again, if I can put another knight on e5, if I can constantly threaten rook b1, it should be holding. But the fact is that for a human being to do this is very difficult, first of all. And also, it's, it's going to take a while. Black can torture me for a long time, and I have no chances. So if you plug this into a computer and it says about equal, or maybe slightly better for black, but mostly equal, you, you can't be paying attention to it that much. You have to realize that in a practical game, this is already really difficult, and that you have to be precise and have a clear idea. And playing with a4, rook g1 is, is a very tricky way to play. And again, for a human being, I don't think it's clear that this is going to be the way to create counterplay. So between, as far as between knight e2 and knight d1, this decision, I, I'm not mad at myself for not seeing a4, king d2. That's kind of silly. And in this position, I should have really considered which one was better. So the key is I have to discover where my knight needs to go. And that's the key to discovering where my knight should go here. My knight needs to control f6 and e5. And the reason for this is that if the king gets up to f6, he could just win my f-pawn. Not to mention, defend the g-pawn. If his rook ever gets active, it's going to be a nightmare for me, as we'll see in the game. So I should have chosen knight d1. And the idea is that, after king d7, if black tries bishop h5, incidentally, I can play here, and even this move f6 kind of clever and the idea is that if pawn takes there's bishop h7 and pawn takes pawn in the air so this is actually not good to allow for black so let's say black plays king d7 i play rook g1 and black can play king e7 but the whole point is that my knight comes to e3 knight g4 is in the air this rook's still passive i probably should hold and again there are definitely ways black can try to play on black can move over the knight to f6 Maybe try bringing the king back after that, fix the rook. But it's going to be very difficult, at least, for black to continue. And again, I think this approach was much more human. Rather than commit to a4, I'm fixing my knight, I'm fixing my rook. I have black at least at bay for the moment. And I think that this would have been a much wiser choice from my point of view. In the game, I played knight e2, thinking, just thinking I need to improve my knight, which is understandable, but you got to have a plan. Sometimes just playing move to move works, but here you need to know where that knight's going. And I was trying to go, to, 
I don't even know where I was going. I thought G6. I thought I'd go to E5 via G6. I don't know what I was thinking, but it was not good. And this really cost me because now after King D8, Knight F4, King E7. Here I retreat to G3, which is probably not the best choice. Rook G1 is in general a better square, so I have access to B1. But it's already very difficult. Rook G1, Knight C8. And here come my last two mistakes which seal my fate. And they're both shocking decisions to me now. But at the same time, it's understandable. Because the fact is that when you have a position like this, you don't like sitting. You don't like doing nothing because you feel like black has so many improvements. But not butchering your position is more important. So here I should have played very slow. King d2. If, king, if knight d6, just a4. Rook back. So I have rook b1 always. So it's not so easy for black. And really just hope to keep things at bay. Maybe eventually try to fix this knight. This knight on f4 is not as good as it would be on e3. But it's a bad position, but maybe I have chances. Maybe I can hold it. Who knows? Um, I played knight g6 check, which is understandable. It was my idea. But the fact is that and it was one of those situations where I just know this is not good for me during the game. But I couldn't help myself. I was like, I need to do something. My position's terrible. But if your move makes your position look worse, it's better to just play like King D2, just very marginal improving move over a move like this. And being able to sit on your hands and not butcher your own position, easier said than done, especially in the moment. When you analyze games, these moves are obviously bad. But when during the moment, you really your hand just wants to play Knight G6, you got to sit on your hands. Don't let yourself make your position worse. So knight g6 check, very bad decision. And after bishop takes, I even managed to take back with the wrong piece. Rook takes g6 was my original idea. And after king f7, I just thought, oh man, his rook activates, this looks terrible. But I could play king d2. If rook h8, rook back. I still have rook b1 ideas. It's at least difficult for black to just murder me. Whereas I decided to take with the f-pawn thinking that at least I have a potentially dangerous pawn. But this is ridiculous, because the g7 pawn's not weak, and he finds a very, very accurate move here by playing rook f8. Now my f-pawn is weak, rook f4 hits both pawns, and I realized, oh, I'm just dead. Originally, I thought I could check and go here with the idea of g7 being weak, which is what I played. But he plays a very intelligent move with knight d6, and the whole idea is that now if rook h7, he has knight e8. And he actually found this without too much time on his clock. One of his main weaknesses as a player was time trouble. And if I had kept the position complicated, kept pressure up, maybe I could have used this. But when you have such a pleasant position, as long as you see a couple ideas, it's not so hard to play quickly. So the, his time trouble kind of went wasted from my point of view. Now, from here on, I definitely could have resisted a little bit better, perhaps. But the fact is that when you have a position, you have a worse minor piece... Weak pawns, every single pawn except maybe g6 for the moment is weak. That's not a good sign. Black has a much better structure. The rook is now activated. It's just lost. And against any player as strong as this guy was, this, I mean, you know, pretty, pretty tough GM, there's no real chances. So I fought on, of course, rook h7, knight e8, king b2. I didn't want to part with this guy, but defending it, and allowing rook f4 and rook takes d4 I thought was even worse. <laughs> so I gave up the f-pawn. Bishop c2, kind of embarrassing, but I don't want to give up the a2 pawn either. This is what happens when you have too many weak pawns. You just can't defend them all. So he played king e7. And here he doesn't win in the quickest way, but he wins very slow and very sure, which is absolutely the better way to do it. So a4, a5, king c3. He gives me a check. And he goes back. Again, he trying to make time control, so he's not in a rush, which is absolutely the correct approach. Rook h7, knight c7, so he maneuvers his knight again to d8, which looks a little silly, but his knight can always improve. I can never stop him from improving his knight. So he's putting it there temporarily, fixes his king, and here I try to be active, but really it's doing nothing. He attacks my g-pawn, rook h8. It's only faux activity, I'm not actually doing anything. Bishop g4, and here I was actually expecting to resign after knight takes d4. Uh, I saw this move, but I was basically, when you have this many weaknesses, it's just a matter of time. So, of course, if king takes rook check, but he wasn't even thinking of that. He just wanted to play it simple, which is fine. Takes, takes. 
I gave one check. If he went to e7, I would have played on with rook b8, even though it's certainly still losing. But he went the easier way with king c7. He's going to play rook g6, check, outside pass pawn, extra pawn on the queen side. My pawns are still horrible. <laughs> it was time to give up the ghost. So, a very painful loss for me. And again, it would have been easy to write off to being sick, to being, you know, not being able to focus so easily, to, ah, I got a little unlucky, I missed a tactic. These are mistakes. Not just during the game, but mistakes as far as how you view it. I, at least in my opinion, it's very important to be hard on yourself. Not to just go, oh, you're a terrible chess player, you're a horrible human being, but to at least make you own up to your mistakes. I maybe could have argued my prep could have been better just in terms of not take him on in his best line, try to swerve, but that's arguable. I mean, I'm trying to learn my lines too. But really, my mistakes were I got a little bit too lackadaisical by playing queen a3. I could have calculated rook h7 better. Then I should have gone for this f3 move, realized I had to slow down, not just play for initiative, just put pressure on. And then, of course, there was just the collapse of, okay, I didn't spend enough time, I maneuvered my knight in the wrong way, and then let him trade it off for his bishop, which made his life so much easier. And all, all these mistakes against a very strong, solid player are just not going to cut it. And in the future, I have to be much more careful in watching out for these errors. So that's at least how I autopsy a game of myself. Believe it or not, not all my games are this bad. Sometimes I manage to play a bit better, but... The fact is that if you're not hard on yourself when you're playing your worst, you know, if you're not really making yourself own up to your mistakes, you're going to repeat them. So it's very important to make yourself not only admit to these mistakes, but really take note so that when you play, get these situations in the future, you'll make better decisions. So I hope you enjoy my return to these video, this video series. Um, and... I actually set up a Patron account. If you guys really enjoy this series, want to encourage me to do, you know, to continue it. I definitely want to upgrade my my video a little bit. I want to upgrade other things. So definitely, if you guys want to make a contribution, there's a Patron link below. And also definitely subscribe to my YouTube channel so you know exactly when those videos hit. But you can expect one once a week uh, for the foreseeable future. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video and come back for more. Thank you.